Okay, so this is a little off topic, but this is this is pretty useful. Uh, all of this time throughout this whole class of three weeks, four weeks, we've been um, working with Notepad++ and there's plenty of other software out there to write our code. So I mentioned Notepad++ and on the Mac Text Wrangler, but there's a bunch of other ones. Adobe Brackets is a good one. Sublime Text is another one. So basically you want to use that kind of software to edit your code because editing it in Word or plain old notepad is just not going to cut it. Those, that software is not designed for code writing. And so this, now we should be getting used to it, that notepad gives us all of these kinds of hints, code hints and such. It doesn't write the code for us, and it maybe is not as explicitly helpful as it could be, like other software. But it's very helpful in that if you click on a tag, it'll show you its pair. If it doesn't show you its pair, that means it's broken. It's not connected. So that's one way to do debugging, to figure out what's the problem. I thought I typed it all properly, but why is it not working? Well, I often try to figure out my errors by clicking on a tag and seeing where its pair is. No pair highlights. Oops, misspelling. Also, as we do this more, we should get used to these <coughs> colors. And I'm sure there's a meaning behind them, but just get used to, okay, most of the code is going to be blue. Sometimes something's going to be red. Look at how class is red, rel is red, target is red. Well, all of those are attributes. These red guys are attributes of A. This is red, and it's an attribute of div. So those colors do have a meaning. The purple, it's usually something inside of quotes that is part of an attribute. See, page and PC, UI content. So there's consistency there. And of course, comments are the things that are green. So when suddenly your code doesn't look right, you know, suddenly you're writing and you realize at some point, why is everything green? That should be a giveaway right away. You started a comment somewhere, didn't close it. If all your code at one point is um, correct and then suddenly everything's like purple or black where it shouldn't be, like why is this div purple here? Now why is that div purple there? I thought all divs are blue. Yes, because I forgot to close my, my, my quote there. And there is other software, honestly, that is much more cutting edge than this. And maybe on a future class I'll adopt it, but it works so far, and I teach it, and it, it works fine. But there's other software like Brackets and Sublime Text and a new one. I think it's called Visual Microsoft Visual Code that I looked into. Some of these are so smart, you're starting to type a tag, and it automatically closes the tag for you. You don't have to remember to open and close it. I start typing section and it closes section right away. I believe Notepad does have that, but I think we've there's something with our version because uh, other people that install it on their home computer, their version does that. Uh, if you and I should look it up. Why does it do that? If you if yours does that, maybe I and if you figure out how to turn it on, tell me and I'll tell the class. But Notepad plus plus is going to work for us really well, and the color coding is very helpful. This color scheme, however, might not be the best for coding, for long-term coding. Usually a bright white background that is shooting photons at your eyes for three hours at a time is not the best for you. Bright white background might not be the best. So we can change the, uh, the color scheme to be a little more pleasant looking. I'm going to keep it on white because that's the most contrasty for my monitor, for my, for my um, projector here. But I'm going to show you these other color schemes that might be better for you because they don't, they're not so harsh on the eyes. And you can do this on most software, but you do this here in Notepad by going to the. Let's try this. Let's go to the section, uh, the settings um, menu item at the top. It's next to language and macro. Click on settings and click on style configurator, which I don't think is a real word but let's see the style configurator and at the top it says our current theme is default and we can go in and change every single thing about like what's our bad brace color right now it's red well we can make it pink what about the edge color the color the fold margin we can totally customize this to make things stand out like whenever there's a you know a, a bad brace if there's no proper braces you can change that to a more obvious color 
Well, there's, it's also got a bunch of themes built in. Defaults, default theme. Click on that and select, for example, uh, Mossy Lawn. Notice now the color changed back there. That might be a little more pleasant to look at. Not on my monitor here, because now that text is a little too dark. It might not be so readable. On your monitor, it might be great. Twilight. It's very pleasant. Uh, classic Vim dark blue. The one I use on my own computer is Bespin. It's got a good mixture of different obvious colors. It's not so bright that it's annoying to look at for hours. I don't like that the comments are that color, but obviously I can go in and find wherever the comments are and change them. and never do. But I like Bespin at home. I'm going to keep mine on default because it's most readable for you all. But I'm going to tell you right now, if you are a serious programmer, you need to select Hello Kitty. <laughs> You can choose any one you want, but I'm going to keep it on default. And if you do make a change, you want to save and close to keep the change. And this is totally optional, but it is useful once you do coding for long periods of time. Modern or other more newer code editors like Sublime Text and, and Brackets and uh, Visual Studio Code are automatically oftentimes in a dark color scheme because it's better for your eyes. Right now it's like bright light coming right at your eyes. And if you don't want that, change your style. Okay, so back to our code. What we were going to do was, you see that when you open the art calendar, we've got the side panel, we want to make an obvious close button. We'll put a close button on the panel itself. So we'll go over to the aside. I already scrolled around. I lost it, so I can control F to find and search for aside or search for art cal. Just find your, your panel again. If you're already where it's supposed to be, great. But I lost mine, so I'm just going to search art C. There's only a couple of things in my document that have that. There we go, art cal, line 60. Okay, so what I want to do is create a button to close my panel. Even though it already has that built-in functionality, it might not be obvious to people. It's not a bad idea to be a little redundant in your user interface. So let's add this before the August heading 1. It's going to be a button, but we'll write close panel. It's going to be a button, so this will have the A tag. We're going to make a button before the August text, close panel. When we when we close when we close this art panel, it should simply take us back to the art section. So this needs an href pound art. So when we click that, it takes us back to the art screen, the art article. We want this to be a button. Oops, data roll button. And with an icon, data icon, we've got one called delete. That'll just put a little X. Like to exit out to close it. So save it and run it at this point. We're not quite done with it yet. But you should have your side panel open up, a brand new button at the very top. It should work if you click it. Um, 
it's got the word close panel and the icon delete. Okay, so close panel. Click it. Doesn't quite work yet, but we've got a big obvious close panel. Here's what it further needs. The documentation says that we we want a button and we want an, we want another attribute so that it um, fully works like a close button. So next, after data icon, we can add data rel. What's the relationship of this button to this panel? And this is close. It will close whatever panel it's currently on. Data rel close. And you saw a moment ago that it was a big obvious button. I don't want it to say the words literally close panel. I just want that icon. So we can, we can do that. We can remove the text of a button so it's just the icon. So after data rel, this is going to be a weird one, data-icon, POS, icon position, equals, quote. Because usually we can use data icon pause, data icon position, to position a button on the left or the right or the top or the bottom of a button. But weirdly, we can also use it so that we have no text on the button. And therefore, it'll just give us the icon. So we could write data icon pause equals right or left or top or bottom on some contexts. Here, we want no text, just the icon. So let's see if that works. Save it and run it. This should then be, when you click it, it closes it. Only the icon. Back to the art article, the art section. No text is one word, no capitals. Yeah. Yes, we're going to do that next. We're going to do that next because I don't like that it's default on the left. I want it on the right, which is what I would normally find where I would normally find it at. Let's see if this one works. Our calendar. There we go. Little X. Confirm that you wrote data icon pos, P-O-S, no text. Getting rid of the the text itself. Yeah. We should have something there because um, then there's no A tag that really is attached to anything. So we should technically have something there, but we can then not display it with no text. So I think if you don't put the no text part in, it makes a bar. It's blank, but it's a bar. Oh, it still makes like a blank wide bar. Yeah, because there's even though we might not write anything, there's still something there according to the default HTML. I think I saw a hand for a moment. What was yeah, it's still going to leave like a, a, a little basic bar. So what we'll do then now is, okay, I like that X there, but I want it on the right side. That's going to be via CSS. So we'll see how we can edit that. Space 
Guys, this is like these mice are so sensitive that we were actually moving right here. Mm -hmm. You were moving your hand at the moment you were clicking. Okay, so uh, I want that little X on the right side. Uh, we'll do this through CSS. We can write a little CSS code to move it to the right side. It needs a little bit of setup though, so here's what we need. In order to move this little X to the right side, um, I've found that one of the best ways is to wrap a div tag around it. A div is a generic container. And then in that container, force it to the right side. So there's many ways to accomplish many of these tasks, but here's one of the ways. So we will give yourself a line before the button, and we'll add the div tag. And then obviously we need to close the div tag, so add it after the href, before heading 1. And then you might as well indent it. So I've added a div before the button and after. Close the div, of course. Open close div. This is a generic container, which we then can use to control the contents in the div through CSS. This is a very common practice. Create divs or related spans and whatever in the div or the span we can then control easier through CSS. In order for us to control it then it needs some sort of name, either a class or an ID. Well if it's an ID that'll work, but if it's an ID it'll be limited that we can only use this code one place in our whole project because it's an SPA. It's all in one document. So a class will work better here. We will apply it multiple times. So div, we will add the attribute class so we can reuse it. And there's always, what do we call these things? Well, this is going to be close btn write. We can use shorter names, of course, but this, when I have a whole list of CSS rules, hopefully when I read this, it'll tell me what does this do. It'll, clo it'll be for a close button on the right side of the screen. So hopefully we name our classes because we invent them with something meaningful. We, we come to learn what UL means. If you've never heard of UL before, what is possibly UL? Unordered list. Maybe when we name our own, we can be a little more obvious. So let's save the HTML file. And now we need to define in our CSS file what does close btn write actually mean? What does it do? So you need to open the codica.ext.css file within your folder, your project folder. In your project folder, you want to edit in notepad codica.extra.css. <clears throat> We've got a little bit of code so far div image wide and div image crop. Hopefully, those names jog your memory about what those did div image wide stretches out any image to fill 100% of its container and div image crop crops an image that overflows its container. You can of course add comments to explain that to yourself. But next we need to define dot close btn write dot because it's a class. So the CSS file has a definition for all of our CSS selectors. These are technically selectors. They are selecting something. I often also call them rules. 
CSS rules. You might hear them called that way. But here I'm defining my CSS selectors. And so this trick will let us move our will meta, let us move our button to the right side of the container. Yes. Do you add this class to the A tag? No, I added it to a brand new div tag that we created. I'm just curious, could you? Or is this it won't exactly work because we need to define this button in the in the context of a container. So the A itself is not a container. So we're defining it on the level above it. You know, this tag, this A tag is in this div container, and we're controlling the div container, not the A tag. And so the trick to get this to work is there's a CSS uh, property called float colon right semicolon. So anything inside of this div will float on the right side of the screen. We've added close btn right to the div, so anything in that div would be aligned to the right. And the only thing in that div at the moment is that close button. So remember to save both files. Remember we're working on the index file and the CSS file, so if either of those are still red, remember to click the Save All button right there, the, the multiple little disks. That'll save all your open files. Save all, and then check the result. calendar, there it is, floating on the right. Does that work for everyone? I noticed that when it's got on the same level as the August thing, when I yeah. say in the float, it just. Yeah, um, and that's better because previously it was taking up its own line, uh -huh. and if we had moved it to the right, there'd be like dead space there. So float right is. Technically, what is happening is it's seeing what's on the screen, ignoring it, and then moving to the right of it. Like, let's say we have text and we want, we have a picture and we have text to wrap around it. We could do something like that as well. So it does show up on the same level as August because it, it, it counted all of this as one element, basically, and then floated that to the right of it. So we ignored it and it went to the right of it. If August has been a long word, had gone all the way to the side there, it would probably be above it then. That's a good point. Let's see what happens. Yes, just one moment. Nope, smart enough to, to cut the line. Which, uh, which document? The CSS. Okay, so we're seeing that through CSS we can control things. Duh, we've said that before. CSS is our presentation layer. So let's add a little bit of CSS, speaking of CSS, to further uh, define the design of our documents a little bit more. Um, on our, on this same art screen, we've got um, two buttons, the art calendar button and the uh, catalog button. And they and they sit side by side. They sit on the same line. They're divided in the middle with a column. It looks nice. But the problem is, this is what I'm talking about here, the problem is that as, as I expand my screen, well, these buttons keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And at a certain point, they look way too big. What I want is that these buttons, you know, are, are a size that is adequate, adequately large for them. 
and that they also stay centered within these columns. Remember, there's some invisible columns here. So that'll require some CSS. Um, we can either write the CSS and then attach it to the appropriate element, or set up the element and then write the CSS. doesn't quite matter, but sometimes as a beginner you don't know which to do. So let's kind of do it the same way we did this, where we wrote the HTML first and then the CSS to control it. So we'll get back to the CSS file in a moment. Let's go back to your HTML, your, your presentation layer. And let's find where those two buttons are at. It's at about line 100. You got class UI grid A, column A, column B, block A, block B, right here. So these buttons currently have the behavior that they extend as far as they can within their container. And in this case, the container is the first column and the second column. Well, we can change the behavior of a button so that it only takes up as much space as it needs based on the text in the, the button, the text and the icon. Um, so we've got on line 101, data roll button, data icon calendar. Let's add another data attribute. Data-inline equals true. Let's add that to both the art calendar button and the catalog, uh, catalog button. Catalog has this other stuff, rel and so forth, but it still has data role and data icon. After data icon, let's add data inline true to the catalog. So add them both, save it and run it just to see what inline really does, and then we'll proceed. Data dash inline. equals true. Unfortunately, that might mean something's wrong, because it's supposed to take up as much space as it wants unless we do this. Did you try actually stretching out your, your window? Because when I stretched out my window, then it got really large. Okay, data inline. Like that. So I've got a wide screen, but the buttons only take up as much space as they need. They look weird because I want them centered. This is over here, and that's over there. I want them centered within these imaginary columns. So that comes next with the CSS. That's what data inline true is doing. There's my code again right here. Data inline true. And so the way this will work is, again, uh, we'll do the trick with the, similar trick with the uh, aligning that button to the right where we added a class. We had a div we made up a class called um, um, BT close button, right. close button right. So we're going to need another class uh, to further align these things here. But if you notice, these are inside of a block, and they're inside of a div, and there's already a class. Well, the cool thing is we can actually add more than one class at a time. We're not limited to only one class. We can add multiple classes. So let's back up here to line 99, where we've got the div of class UI grid A. That's built into jQuery Mobile CSS. It defines how this currently looks. I want to alter it a little bit with my own CSS, with my own class. So inside of the quotes, after the A, add a space, and I'm going to add another class. I'm going to 
going to have the this class controlling it, and my own class that I will invent further controlling it. We'll call this grid align center. Very important, there is a space here. You have to have a space here, or else suddenly you're going to have a class called UI grid A grid align center instead of UI grid <coughs> A and grid align center. So that space there is very important. So that's all the setup we need on the HTML. We've got a grid, it has a class, now we can define the CSS for it. So switch back to the CSS file. Let's create the selector. So after close BTN, dot grid align center we're going to explain what does that do, what does that mean, and my shortcut here was I copied what I wrote in the HTML file and pasted it here. I'm not going to try to retype it, I might misspell it. So a shortcut there, copy your code, paste it. Because even if you misspell it, I'm inventing a class, even if I misspelled it as a line like that, and if I keep it consistently misspelled, it'll work. That's the funny thing. When you invent your own classes and IDs, if you misspell it, Consistently, you're fine. If you misspell predefined tags, of course, you're not fine. And that button, deep down, it's a button, but deep down, what is it? Trick question. What is that button? Hmm? Just code? That's too deep. One level higher. Mm, too deep again. Not deep enough. I think I heard someone say, it's text. And you're right. It's text. That text deep down is, that word, those buttons are text that we then added A tags to. So we have a built-in property here called text-align, and we can say center. Center the text. Even though they're buttons, they look like buttons deep down their text. And if we then define a rule that says anything that this class is attached to align the text to the center, it'll align our buttons to the center because they just look like buttons but they're text. So go ahead and save it and save both files and run it. Well, if it worked, they're not going to be leaning on the left anymore. They're going to be in the center. And if you resize your screen, they're going to stay in that center imaginary columns. And at a certain point, yes, if you go too far, they bump into each other. So we cannot fully test this. Um, we would want to test it on different web browsers, different monitor sizes, mobile devices and such. But this is a pretty good result here. Maybe we could also, as we test this, we're seeing that on all devices it's overlapping at a certain point. We could then decide, well, maybe we don't need to call it Art Calendar because we're on the Art page. What if we just call it Calendar? Then we've got a smaller word there that would prevent it a little bit more from overlapping. Because we could think about, well, what if we resize the text depending on the size of the monitor? That could work, but then you've got text that's going to be smaller and looking out of place compared to other text, which is normal. So there's lots of ways to try to solve these user experience issues. Maybe one of them there's probably a, an official phrasing for it and such, but you know, you get more with less. 
uh, you'll still be able to accomplish what you need if you simply remove the word art because we're in the calendar we're in the screen of art and therefore that calendar will make sense that it's an art calendar Yes. It's here in your CSS. It's text dash align center. We're about to do the break very soon, but what you might be missing is you want to back up into your HTML and you want to make sure you've added grid align center to the class of the UI grid A, not block A, grid A. So since we set this as a class, we will be able to reuse it throughout our project. Okay, so um, let's take our last break. When we come back, what, what I want to do then is um, make these buttons work. On the Hello PC page, the concept here was that we would have basic computer classes, intermediate computer classes, advanced computer classes. And if you click on one of these buttons, it will show more content. So uh, this will give us practice on creating more pages and such. Yes. That grid line center, can you put that same class on the other? Grid? It'll also work, and that's what we want to do, and that's what we'll eventually do. Wherever you have any other grid A's, mm -hmm. just attach the same grid align center, and it'll obey. It'll you align it. You can use that same class on block B? No, you wouldn't put it there. Um, you're putting it on the top level. You're putting it on the grid, not the block. Oh, that's right. okay. But if you if you have any other divs that are grid A's no, or grid you. B's and such. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's 8.05. Let's take a 10 minute break. We'll be back at uh, 8.15 and we will populate our uh, app with a bit more content. <laughs>